My name is Aisha Humairah binti Idris. My number matrix 1203120. Today, we will present and review about the book entitled An Introduction to Philosophy. This book introduces significant theoretical and practical questions and a precise understanding the meaning and methods of philosophy. This book has written a solid introduction to philosophy for students with little to no background in the subject matter. His text covers the core ancient philosophers, basic logical reasoning, exploration in the philosophy of science and mind, and the main branches of ethics. Includes the human condition, logic, uh, reality, knowledge, freedom, history, ethics, and religion. For the first chapter, what philosophy is? We can get a better understanding of philosophy by considering what sorts of things other than scientific issues humans might inquire into. Philosophical issues are as diverse and far-ranging as those we find in the, in the science, but a great many of them fall into one of three big topic areas, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. And for chapter 2 and 3, uh, how to do philosophy and ancient philosophy, uh, historically historically organized covers the core ancient philosophers and explain the three major ancient Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. For chapter 4, Rationalism, according to rationalism, some knowledge can be had through reason alone. For rationalists, no experience is required to be justified in accepting in accepting their truths. In this chapter, explain about rationalism on Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz views. For chapter 5, Empiricism, um, Empiricism, on the other hand, takes all knowledge to be ultimately grounded in sense experience. For, for chapter 6, in contemporary philosophy of science, we look to see what methods, what methods actually work and better understand the significance of this. In this chapter, we will see a few developments over the course of the 20th century to better understanding how philosophy of science has developed into what it is today, and also explaining some details such as logical positivism and demarcation problem. Rather, in chapter 7, philosophers of mind have detailed explanation of how our physical brains realize and carry out the functions of how of many mental states. In this chapter, organize some of the some of the progress philosophy of mind has contributed over the past century. For chapter 8, love and happiness, in this chapter we will study things that matter, things that um, that are important and also explain Aristotle's view of philia and also value in a live in a loving relationship uh, and examine uh, the nature of morality generally and and uh, for the next chapter chapter 9 meta ethics uh, what is being evaluated for goodness action character lives or societies in this chapter we will not be concerned with the goodness of any of these things but with more general questions about the fundamental nature of goodness. For chapter 10, right action, in this, in this chapter we will explain normative uh, ethical principles that are intended to describe how things are, how people think or how they behave but more concerned how we should be motivated and how we should act. For the last chapter, social justice explains Plato's conception of justice and also what is the functions of government according to Loki and how is it justified and explain roles to principles of social justice as fairness. So after we know or understand the details of this book, I will introduce information about this book in more detail. The title of this book is An Introduction to Philosophy by W. Rose Payne and published by BC Campus. The place was published at uh, Believer College in 2015. This book has 130 pages and 11 chapters. Lastly, um, this book, um, lastly, this book, uh, subject areas is mainly humanities and philosophies. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Zahira Muhammad Fairuz. Inshallah, today I will be sharing uh, my my thoughts uh, from the book that I have just read, which is called Introduction to Philosophy. And the points that I'm going to share 
is from chapter 5 and it's called empiricism okay so what is empiricism is a theory that all knowledge is derived from the sense experience it is stimulated by the rise of experimental science it developed in the 17th and 18th centuries uh, expounded in particular by john locke secondly by george berkeley and david hume all right so let's move on to the first philosopher and let's see what is his idea about empiricism. So John Locke, he's um, born from the year of 1632 and he died in the year of 1704. So he had his own ideas and perspective about this. So he believed that people had equal um, and natural rights to liberty. He meant by liberty as being free from domination and by others. And Locke also develops his empirism and epistemology in his essay uh, concerning human understanding. So he has two understanding and he made it into two definitions. So the first definition will be primary qualities. Okay. So how did he came about this is because he argued that all knowledge is obtained through experience and Locke thought that we are born knowing nothing and we are born knowing nothing means we are trying to take our knowledge through um, senses maybe you can say. So um, he defined um, this thought into two categories which is the primary qualities and the secondary qualities so first let's look what does he means about the primary qualities so the primary qualities that um, the philosopher John Locke is trying to say is like for example the qualities that physical objects themselves have means whatever that belongs to the object so for example an apple all right so an apple it has solidity, density, weight, mass, height, and depth and width. So we look at it and know it as that what we see. But however, for the secondary qualities, uh, they are just in our minds, but they get there through the primary qualities. Secondary qualities are objectively real. They can be. They can only be subjectively subjectively perceived. An example, an apple again. So we look at it subjectively by the color, the texture, the smell and the sound. So Locke believed that the distinction between primary and secondary qualities, um, qualities explain the disagreements that we all have about the perception about the outside world. Mm, quite an interesting uh, perception. But however, uh, we always use the correct understanding which is the Quran and Sunnah from our Islamic perspective. Moving on to the second philosopher and his understanding on apriricism is that uh, he sees this as that your mind is just a bundle of impressions and there's nothing in the world except for so many minds um, having their various perceptions. So he call it as the cortigo um, uh, ergosum to be is to be perceived so he believed that god is the only perceiver moving on to the third philosopher david Hume. in this chapter also he had his own ideas and one of the things that caught my attention is that his understanding about self the idea of self doesn't persist doesn't persist over time there is no you that is the same person from the birth Till the death. If having a certain identity means possessing the same sets of properties, then how could anyone really maintain the same identity from one moment to the next? Aha, uh -huh, something interesting that I learned. And second that um second thing that this uh, philosopher David Hume had in his understanding on this chapter was the induction. So the matters of fact. I have a cat, you can believe it or not, possible true of observation so he observed regularities generally by having a, a, a theory so for example you said that um, you know that all fires are hot and is burning it will burn you right so even though you have never experienced heat in Africa you use this ideology of all fires are hot and burning 
into the items that are so all unobserved fires are hot too. So it can be anything that is hot like a sun or a scorching sunny day in a different country or a different climate or of a different um, um, geographical structure. And you know that people are saying the heat is is striking so hard on me and I'm really, really draining and I'm in thirst. So we use this induction of this kind of theory from this philosopher's point of view that all fires are burning hot. So we perceive this, that all other things that are hot would be similar to this situation. These other interesting things that I have learned from this chapter 5 from the introduction of philosophy. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Fatin Auni Binti Shalahuddin. My metric number 1201904. Chapter 6. Philosophy of Science. We learn that logical positivism known as empirism, influenced by him and a new achievement in symbolic logic for the goal of better comprehending the foundations of mathematics. This inspiring a group of philosophers and scientists in Vienna to use the same logical tools to analyze and clarify philosophical concerns in science. In this case, Karl Popper, a philosopher, believed that there is no acceptable solution to the problem of induction. Popper offers the method of conjecture and refutation in place of induction to establish what we should anticipate to see if the hypothesis is correct while designing an experiment. His method works to provide us with knowledge of the work while avoiding the problem of induction. According to him, there is no rational methodology or logic for evaluating how scientists come up with hypotheses. They are just conjecture and no amount of evidence is capable of inductively confirming hypotheses in giving a reason for thinking our hypotheses are true. Next, auxiliary hypotheses. There are no inductive grounds for believing that proposed scientific hypotheses and explanations are correct, but by removing the lies, we can narrow the truth. For example, an expectation based on the hypothesis we are interested in testing and combining with the variety of auxiliary hypotheses. Here's an example. A hair, according to our theory, is faster than tetris. As a result on this theory, we can predict that hair will win a race versus tetus. But what if tetus come out on top in the race? So basically, the hypothesis not thereby falsified by because of the presence of a number of auxiliary hypotheses. Assalamualaikum. My name is Futri Narukamarina binti Abu Kori, and my metric number is 1201938. Philosophy of Mind. Philosophy of mind is a branch of philosophy that studies the nature of mind, mental events, mental functions, mental properties, consciousness, and their relationship to the physical body, particularly the brain. Philosophers of mind along with cognitive psychologists, information scientists, and neuroscientists have begun to work out detailed explanations of how our physical brains relies and carry out the functions of many mental states. Here, I will share two items that I learned from this chapter and based on what I have been read in the book Introduction to Philosophy. There are some of the progress philosophy of mind has contributed over the past century. Among them are Descartes' dualism, Empirism leads to logical behaviorism, the brain state identity theory, functionalism, and the last one is consciousness and property dualism. First, what I have learned is the brain state identity theory suggests that the mental state is similar to the state of the brain. Contrary to this Carter's dualism, the identity theory takes into account to be a physical thing. That is, it requires the mind to be equal to the brain. Cases of localized brain injury show that different parts of the brain perform different functions. People with lesions in certain areas of the brain tend to find certain mental functions impaired while other functions are left intact. Through the analysis of such cases, they begin to make brain areas according to the functions they perform. Nothing more than saying your mind is your brain, the mental is the physical and nothing more. Our mental state, such as the mental states of being in pain or being happy, are identical to our brain states. And that will be electrochemical events at synapses nerve impulse the movement of chemical messengers, 
the movement of molecules ion etc so when you say you are feeling pain this is nothing more than neurological processes in your brain causing you to feel pain we can see no problems of mind body interaction as they are one and the same so it escapes the problems of dualism secondly functionalists will understand the discussion of mental tendencies differently to have a mental inclination is not by definition simply to satisfy if they demands on the other hand being in a mental state is being in a basic perhaps an observable state that fulfills a specific functional role the molecular structure that makes the spring flexible may not be visible to us but for a spring to be flexible for it to have this disposal it is for it to be in some basic state that makes the spring such that if we apply a force on it it will bend and absorb the energy mental states as constituted solely by their functional role unlike logical behaviorism functionalism holds that mental states are internal states of thinking creatures and not just behavior in contrast to behaviorists functionalists do not attempt to define mental speech in terms of talking about observable behaviors and unlike the identity theory functionalism does not claim the mind and the brain are the same although both are physical there is in fact a difference one can be a functionalist of mental states and a cartesian dualist assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh my name is Nur Ainina Fatini Binti Faudin. My metric number is 1203125. The two items I get in the love and happiness chapter are the first, if we love someone is if we are willing to do everything for them. And the term friendship, but for the sake of interest, we make the friendship relationship will not last long. Apart from that, philosopher also explained that a person's interest will never make the thing he is interested in become his because it originally belongs to someone else. The second item is the feeling of worrying too much about the others without thinking of oneself if you are very bad and can win the element of happiness. He added, the beauty of human appearance cannot be judged if their character is not complete first. Philosophers also discuss the human need for moral support from those around them in the pursuit of happiness in life and solitude because human beings give strength when they depend on each other. Moreover, the path of happiness for every human being will not be the same as the example given by someone who is often scolded but remain happy with each other and so on. In addition, happiness can affect the way people live life, whether in terms of emotion, daily routine, diet and more. This chapter also emphasizes that a dream or hope is the mainstay in determining the direction of the purpose of the path of life to be happy despite not knowing bread between the two or falsehood of the matter. Assalamualaikum, my name Nur Ayuni binti Azmi. My metric number 1201874. Chapter 10, Right Action. Focus on normative ethics, both utilitarianism and case ethics of respect for person can be understood as aiming to formulate action guiding normative ethical principles. Later in the chapter, we will consider a push to normative ethics that are not so concerned with identifying exceptionless laws of right action. Our understanding of right action doesn't have to be expressible in terms of strict rules. Feminist ethics finds value in caring relationship, but Taking relationship to be good doesn't directly lead to specific rules for action as militarianism might. Environmental ethicists have advanced various proposals for expanding the realm of moral relevance to include other species or systems of life as a rule. 
This is not to deny that people matter morally. But many environmental ethicists deny that people are all bad matter. What is utilitarianism? Utilitarianism is an action, is the net total of usual cause by the action, minus any pain caused by the action. As utilitarianism is a utilitarian theory of ethics, we state that a person act is morally right if and only if it produces the best possible result in that specific situation. But utilitarianism have a problem too. A problem is for utilitarianism. Perhaps. Perhaps the greatest difficulty with utilitarianism is that it fails to take into account considerations of justice. We can imagine it is where a certain cause of action will produce great benefits for society, but they will be clearly unjust. Next, Emmanuel Kant theory. Manuel Kant's moral theory is grounded in a theory of intrinsic value. Kant takes the only thing to have moral work for its own sake to be the capacity for good will be fine in persons. Persons conceive of as autonomous, rational moral agents, uh, beings that have intrinsic moral work and he beings that deserve moral respect. Chapter 11. Social justice. Social justice is just the idea of goodness as applied to social group. When asked what it means for a society to be just, most of us will think of things like freedom and equality. But things haven't always been thus. Believing liberty and freedom is a pretty recent innovation. We have already noted John Luke as an early advocate of liberal political thinking in the 17th century. Other conceptions of justice were neither egalitarian nor freedom loving. Here we consider Plato. Plato develops his conception of justice in the Republic. Here, Plato developed a view of the ideal state as modeled on that of the ideal person. The state is understood as the person who read life. The idea of justice for Plato was as much a view of the individual person as of the state. Justice was seen as a kind of meta view. The just person is the person who has all the other views and has them in the appropriate integrated balance. People have various capacities and abilities, and we have various duties that correspond to those abilities. We can be courageous in facing threats, temperate in managing our appetites, diligent in carrying out our project, and wise in the deliberative about what to do and how. To be a just person is for the various abilities relevant to the various duties to be playing their proper role. When we turn to the justice of communities, we find different individuals playing the various roles. We want the victory of wisdom with them in the ruling class. The virtue of courage in the military class and the virtues of temperance and diligence in the business class. The just community in Plato view is the community where the various elements stick to their proper rules and cultivate the virtues accurate to those rules. Next, John Luke. Luke's answer is that the authority of government is entirely derived from the concern of its free and equal citizen. How does Luke justify property rights? Luke wrote that 
all individuals are equal in the sense that they are born with certain inalienable natural rights. That is right that are God given and can never be taken or even given away. Among these fundamental natural rights, not said by life, liberty and property. My name is Nurul Afifah binti Muhammad Sabarudin and my metric number is 1201943. As Socrates said that epistemic relativism is a view that has no objective standard for us to judge a certain truth or possible truth about our belief. Just as we know that this view is related to our own belief, which we believe in our truth. What is right for us may not be right for others. There is no boundary between knowledge, belief or opinion on the one hand and truth and reality on the other according to epistemic relativism. To use a ridiculous example, if I think today is Sunday, that's what I'm thinking. And if you think it is Monday, that's what you are thinking. We must be confident in ourselves, regardless of others, and feel with our stand. On the other hand, Socrates was the wisest man in Athens. He made the statement his life mission to better study and understand something. Socrates also found people to have a high reputation and question about their wisdom, yet he encountered a lot of useless wisdom. Most people consider themselves to know about all of them when they do not know. So, we must continue to seek knowledge to cover up self-ignorance. My name is Farida Trusna binti Muhammad Nazri. My metric number is 1201934. My overall comments about the book Introduction to Philosophy is I love reading the book because the book is well discussed and the book is easy to understand. There are 11 chapters in this book and each chapter are leaving many benefits to the reader. If you read the book, you will understand what is philosophy, how to do philosophy, what are the elements of philosophy, how many types of philosophy and what are the types of philosophy. If you have finished reading philosophy book, you will know that philosophical issues are as diverse and far-ranging as those we find in the science, but a great many of them fall into one of three big topic areas, which is metaphysics, epistemology and ethics. Metaphysical issues are concerned with the nature of reality, while epistemology is concerned with the nature of knowledge and justified belief, and ethics is concerned with what we ought to do, how we ought to live, and how we ought to organize our communities. Next, the author wrote the chapters fairly and accordingly based on chapter 1 until chapter 11. The length of the book was so nice and not draggy. If you are interested in history, you will enjoy reading from beginning to end of this book. You will get many benefits from the chapters and will learn a new thing such as what is love and happiness, what is social justice, what is right action and many things. Last but not least, you have to read Introduction to philosophy book because this is the best book ever. Thank you. In my opinion, my comments on this book is this author has prepared an excellent introduction to philosophy for those who have little or no previous knowledge of the topic. The fundamental Ancient philosophers' basic logical thinking, exploration in the philosophy of science and mind, and the main areas of ethics are all covered in the author's text. There is also no index or glossary included with this text. However, in his limited area, the author does a decent job of introduce, introducing the fundamentals. There were no obvious errors in terms of accurate, albeit the author's personal views are occasionally interwoven within the text. The author uses natural, easy to understand language effectively. The organization of the text is consistent. More chapters are kept to a manageable and readable length by the author. The author uses 
his own life as an example at times. While this strategy works well in a classroom, it does not work as well in a textbook that will be used by other professors. This problem could be solved by changing the textbook to a third-person narrative. Regardless, the author's content is well organized and readers will find it simple to explore. However, one big flaw in this book is the lack of illustration charts and other visual aids. Rather than modifying charts to match his narrative, the author has included links to information from other websites. Unfortunately, over half of the websites given were either non-secure or dead. Instead of linking outside the text to questionable sources, he could have easily rewritten the content he linked to within his own book, the author has produced a useful introduction to the fundamental ideas in philosophy. The book is not arranged in the manner of a standard textbook, and it is missing some key concepts that should be covered in the in an introductory philosophy course. More real life examples and illustrations would aid students' understanding of the concept provided. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Nabila Benti Muhammad Nasir. My metric number is 1202913. The conclusion for philosophy is philosophy can be shared nonsense or can be made very comprehensible and may pave a way good for mankind. Yet philosophy confuses more than solve anything. There is no doubt that some sort of philosophy always guides Mankin towards development or degeneration, but this subject is a matter of a book, it cannot be concluded here. Wisdom is a path and not a destination. On that path, you can reject many side paths as detours or dead ends, but there will always be more questions and answers and possibilities to consider. So, in that sense, wisdom and the search for it philosophy which literally means the love of wisdom have answers but no final destination but no final conclusion that's what separates philosophy from religion religion starts with the answers and tries to apply them to new question why philosophy takes the questions as a starting point it's an open worldview versus a close one philosophy is an act of consciousness or awareness or knowing. Awareness always have two ends. Philosophy divides the subject and each division can be divided infinitely. The ends never meet. All question and answer ends up in two, either yes or no. If ends have, has to meet subjects, an object has to become one. This is personal realization. Whenever arguments happen, it will open two ways. That's all. Thank you.